piano players, particularly the guy that I found most interesting was Art Grunwald. Now, I don't know how we managed to find him, and I don't know who managed to find him, but it was with a band that Ted Butterman had. Um, and Art had been working as a security guy. And uh, prior to that, it seems to me, and I could be wrong about this, but he might have been one of these staff musicians at a local radio station. The, the union required them to, to hire a certain number of musicians, even if they didn't play, and that came to be what it was. That they were just standing around the station, and the station didn't have any live music. I, I don't know what, where I heard this, it might be totally wrong, but at any rate, we got Art, and he played with us for quite a while. A most interesting player. He played, uh, he sounded like he probably sounded 30 or 40 years before that. And when we had him, was, it would have been 19, probably the early 60s, I'm thinking. But then he left to go full time into the Gaslight Club with Marty Gross and Frank, and that was kind of the last I ever heard of him. He wasn't exactly a young man then, but at least he wound up playing uh, music at the end of his life, which he should have been doing anyway. That brings me to Little Brother Montgomery, the blues piano player. Little Brother got a job for a trio five nights a week. It was Little Brother, me, and I think Bob Sundstrom started on the banjo with us, but uh, he decided he didn't want to do it. So Brother got uh, Big Mike McKendrick, who uh, had worked with Louis Armstrong, among, other, other, among others. And these guys, are all, they're living on the south side of Chicago, all have other kinds of jobs. And I don't know when Mike had played last, but Brother dug him out and he did a marvelous job. So that was a trio we had there. And uh, we had people come to sit in. It was a place called Hay Rube. And the owner of Hay Rube was intended to operate the place without having to pay anybody off. In other words, he was going to get his uh, whatever his supplies were from non-mafia places, shall we say. And he did that, didn't pay off any of the uh, Chicago politicians. Um, so. He ran into some problems because of that. First of all, the deal was we would play a set and then he would show old movies during our intermissions. Well, the word got out about that. He had an eight millimeter projector there that he'd flip on. He got a visit from the uh, projectionist union and they said, you can't do this unless you hire somebody to run that projector. So that was the end of that. One night, we had a, ba a guy come in and sit in on bass saxophone, and he left his case in front of, the, of, the, of an exit. Well, somehow the fire department happened to send some investigator over that night. So this uh, place got written up for having an exit blocked. All right, he took care of that. And then we got a, uh, a visit from a representative of BMI, Broadcast Music Incorporated, which was one of the two licensors of, uh, you know, for, so you could play the music of, of such and such composer. And so the boss came to me and he said, tell the little brother not to play any BMI tunes. Well, first of all, we don't know which is BMI and which is ASCAP, but secondly, it turns out that Brother was a member of BMI, so he couldn't play any of his own tunes in this place. So this place finally uh, didn't make it, <laughs> unfortunately, because it was a pleasant job. We were also across the street from a place that had decided to call itself Basin Street, and they were bringing people in from out of town, like Earl Hines' band came in there, uh, some other bands of that caliber. I'm not sure that place made it either, but uh, there we were 
doing the best we could.